Cancer does not have to be a death sentence. Even if your doctor tells you so. I've been told on three separate occasions that I was going to die. Yet, here I am today in all my glory. My journey has been a medical roller coaster ride full of personal, full of physical, emotional, and psychological side effects. I have spent time in four hospitals. I have spent time in having 60 days in three different hospitals. I've had two stem cell transplants. I've had over 30 platelet transfusions, and I've stopped counting at 60 as far as my blood transfusions went. But let me be clear. I am not cancer-free. The cancer in my blood cannot be removed, and it will kill me eventually. A matter of fact, three years ago, it should have killed me statistically. So while I am alive and able, I'm sharing my insights and my lessons to increase awareness about this disease and also to help other people who suffer from it or other people who are impacted by it. September 1st, 9, 2019, I was medevac from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to MedStar Georgetown General, General Hospital in Washington, D.C. I went there to get treated for a cancer that was rare, that was very deadly, and was very aggressive. During the treatment, they started out with uh, chemotherapy. They changed my blood multiple times, like I said, up to 58, 59, 60, 70 times for my blood. But they stabilized me. And it surprised everyone that I was alive. 30 days later, they discharged me, and the game plan was to go home, let my body recuperate, and then move on to the stem cell transplant phase of this. That plan got derailed on 19 November 2019, when my rest and heart rate accelerated to 130 beats per minute. And I started to suffocate. It felt like I was suffocating. I couldn't breathe. So, of course, we went to the emergency room. And guess what we discovered? The life-saving chemotherapy had caused multi-system organ failure. It killed my kidneys. It was killing my heart. And it was killing my liver. The next day... I'm informed that the carbon monoxide levels in my body are so high that I need to see a specialist immediately. So I was medevaced via helicopter to another hospital in Virginia. Now, I was on drugs, so I don't remember the flight, but I do remember the cost. $62,000 for a helicopter ride. That is the most expensive flight that I will never remember. <laughs> Amazingly, when we got to the, uh, the hospital, I got stabilized. My liver got in line, but then I had another issue. Doctor came in and said, guess what? Your heart is not pumping enough blood to satisfy your body. It's called cardiogenic shock. The normal heart puts out about 55% to 70% of blood pumped. At 20% or below is considered very severe heart failure. I was at 
10 to 15 percent and declining. They told my wife, we don't expect them to survive. No one expected me to survive. But wait, <laughs> there's more. Later, a cardiologist comes strolling in and informs me Basically, he said I was going to die. I had cardiac arrhythmia, which means my heart rhythm was out of sync. And they wanted to do something called a cardioversion, which kind of shocks the heart back into action. It's like pushing the reset button on a piece of equipment. So we're thinking this might be it. I don't know. Guess what? The good news was the cardio version worked. The better news was it increased my heart rate back up to 35% and it started to climb, baby. And I started thinking, thank God. Thank God. Now, all of this experience has taught me a lot of lessons that I share not just with cancer warriors, but also with everyday people or folks whose lives are impact. And so I'll share a few with you. Never give up. I don't care what they say with you, never give up. That has and remains my strategy despite being told many times that the end is near. Never give up. Remain optimistic. The National Institute of Mental Health reports that between 15 and 24 percent of people with cancer suffer from depression. And guess what? When you have depression, it's easier for you to want to give up. And is it easier for you to give up? It's easier for you to want to die. Being optimistic, staying optimistic is very important. I believe in the power of prayer. When I was at uh, Georgetown, the chaplain asked if she could pray for me. At a different hospital, four nurses asked if they could pray for me, and two volunteers asked if they could pray for me. And I found out a lot of people were praying for me. I felt like I had pray for me across my forehead. <laughs> I was getting a little bit self-conscious. But you know what? It worked. And it's working and saving me. I believe that those prayers, combined with modern medicine, combined with a competent medical team, combined with my faith, combined with my positive attitude, are the reasons I am alive and here with you today. You need to have a good cheerleader, you need to have a good care leader. Caregiver. Everybody in this auditorium could be either one of these folks. A caregiver is someone who can represent and be an advocate for the patient. Mine was my wife, who's in the picture. They also can sign paperwork on your behalf. I remember when I was highly, highly drugged, or let's say medicated. <laughs> Uh, someone will put a piece of paper, will you please sign this? Uh, authorizing a medical procedure or action. I had no idea what the heck I was signing. Had my caregiver not been there to interject and sign, I could have signed, I literally could have signed my life away. You need to have a good cheerleader. Mine is my older brother. When my wife called him and informed him about my illness, he got on a plane from Colorado and flew and came in within a couple of days and his arrival boosted my morale, relieved the stress on my wife, and also kept her from suffering from caregiver burnout. Equally important, and this is very important, Independently and together, they provided the support necessary, the emotional support that I needed. They provided the positive thinking, and they kept me from drifting into the dark side of depression. Chemo brain. 
I import anyone who knows someone that has been through chemotherapy or is going through it now to understand that chemo brain is real. Chemo brain it messes with your head. It's the cognitive dysfunction. It, it confuses you. It, 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 it makes things fuzzy. It's hard to think. When I first got home, I had to ask my wife multiple times, what is our address? What's the phone number? Where do we live? Chemo brain is real. Some closing thoughts. I learned this hard way. Listen to your body. Had I not listened to my body, I would have died alone in a foreign country. Cancer is nonlinear. Ups and downs and lefts and rights and turns and everything else, just like all the illnesses they had to treat me for on top of my, my cancer treatment and knowledge bank. If any of you have knowledge about cancer, I recommend, I implore you to join the conversation by writing something down. Talk about it. Write a book. Educate people about it. Enhance the cancer knowledge base. Cancer is not a death sentence, even though your doctor may tell you so. A diagnosis does not define you. It doesn't define me. I have lived and I will continue to live the life the way that I want to live of my own choosing. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, thank you folks. Come rescue me, please. <laughs>